please give a very warm welcome to Billy Hollis. Good morning. I used to teach calculus at 8 o'clock in the morning. So I hope I know how to keep you awake. In this session, because I'm spanning everybody in the conference, I want to take up some general themes about how you adapt to a time that's pretty tough to, to deal with. I, uh, change, change is a part of our business. We wouldn't be in this business if we weren't comfortable with it. But this is different. This is a different era. I've been in this business. I wrote code for money for the first time in 1978. So I am now celebrating 35 years in this business. And I've seen that there are, there's continuous change, and then there is change that just wrenches apart everything that you do. I try to explain this to, uh, to, to people that don't work in the industry. Because do you have trouble explaining to your mom what you do for a living? <laughs> they don't really get it, do they? So I, I tried to explain about the normal pace of change and what we're going through now. And the way I put it is this the metaphor that seems to work. The normal pace of change, what you deal with all the time, it's as if in real life, every two or three years, you woke up one morning married to a different person. You just look over and now it's, you barely know who this is. Some characteristics of the old wife, but it's different too, different color hair, different preferences. And, but you learn to love the new wife. And then two years later, you get another one. Isn't that kind of what this industry is like? But this kind of change is not, not like that. It's much worse. About once a generation, once every 15 years, there is the change that wrenches everything apart. That's as if you look over one morning and find that you're married to a reptilian alien. You don't, you don't even know what gender it is. It's it, it wrenches your entire life and world apart because it's such a massive change. And that's the nature of what we're living through right now. I, I struggled for ways to kind of illustrate this. And I came up with one that I'd like to, to go through. There's my computer sitting there. Let's talk about the different ways that I, as a user, can interact with it. Well, I got a keyboard. And I got a mouse. And I got a touchpad. And I got the little red thing in the middle that you can jiggle around. OK. that's. That's, that's a pretty number. But then I got the microphone. I can talk to it. I can enter text via voice recognition. I have that installed. It has a camera on it. We probably don't have the software yet to really do this, but eventually then does that mean that I could have gestures with it or maybe it would recognize the emotion from my face? Do you, you know that's coming, right? Your PC in 2020 or whatever, your, your whatever device you have, I can, I'm waiting for the first time when it realizes I'm upset about something. I'm sorry, Billy, I can't let you do that. <laughs> and then touch screen, of course. We see that on various machines. I have a 15-inch Lenovo with a touch screen because I develop touch-based software, so I need that. So that's a lot of ways to interact, right? Well, we aren't done yet. I got this. I'm t changing the slides right now, standing out here in the middle of nowhere. But I don't like this much. I don't like the slide clickers I never have. This guy right here is what I want. This is, let me explain what this, what this is. This is an armband. It fits on your arm here. And it senses muscle contractions and tendon contractions. It also has an accelerometer. Now imagine what that's going to do for you. Let me show you a short video. Was it the other one? This is over here. Let's go to uh, play that for just a few seconds.
Okay, you get the idea? Now, how, how far do you think that thing is? Well, that video is their promo. I've pre-ordered it. <laughs> they, they say they're going to deliver me two of them in January. I want to be doing my slides like this, baby. <laughs> I, I want that bad. But I can certainly imagine a world in which you wear those things around, and they're Bluetooth, you see. They just connect, they can connect to any Bluetooth device. So I can imagine wearing one of those things around and having it just kind of sync with whatever, whatever machine I happen to be around and then controlling it through gesture. Once we build up a gesture language, et cetera. Does that seem un unlikely to you? Does it seem like science fiction? Well, I, I, don't, I don't think it is. And, and notice the trend here. In 1975, I had one way of talking to the computer. We were on one of these machines with rolls of paper. It was teletype. And by 1985, I'd added the mouse. By 2003, I'd added various other pieces. And then today, I'm up to about eight or nine different ways. You recognize the shape of an exponential curve? So yeah, this stuff isn't science fiction anymore. I mean, look at, look, think about it. Kirk was doing the stylus thing back in the 60s. We got the tablet PC in 2003. There's Picard plainly using an iPad. <laughs> they even called it the pad. I don't know if you know this. If you're a Trekkie, you may, may know. P-A-D-D is the name of the thing in the Trek lexicon. And then other things from, uh, from science fiction have come true. This, for example, is from 2001. Let me play you another few seconds of video here. See, what we've got here are these uh, little rectangular things that are just constantly changing and displaying what appears to be more or less random information. Dr. Poole, what's it like living for the best And we've seen that innovation. Active tiles in Windows 8, live tiles, at least. I'd, that's the best comparison I can make to live tiles. How many of you like live tiles, by the way? I just like to poll large audiences. How many of you think they're just a distracting thing that you turn off as soon as you, yeah, that's the majority. <laughs> that's kind of what I figured, because that's where I am too. So science fiction kind of does tell us where we're going, and, and we've been seeing this for a while. Minority Report started the whole gesture thing, and we just put a, just a movie, two-week-old movie now, Ender's Game there, if you haven't seen it, the final battle when they're controlling all of their fleets. Nobody's touching anything, it's just they're doing it all with gesture. So that's the world in which we're enter entering, and as I said, it's the kind of world that makes you feel like you're married to a reptilian alien, because the change is so great. Now, then the, then the question tends to be, well, are we, are we going to adapt to this with the kind of advice that people are giving us now? Because see, I go to a lot of these conferences, I speak at several of them, I go to Microsoft and I talk to people, and what I see is mostly thinking that seems kind of mired in the past. I keep hearing from people that, Billy, you must program everything in HTML5 and JavaScript. How many of you are getting that message pounded into you from various corners? Yeah. Well, I'm not so sure about that. When's HTML5 going to be ready for this thing? I can't wait to see the JavaScript library that will support this. <laughs> I, I mean, I've, I have some inherent distrust in that advice as a way of dealing with this rapid change. Because from what I've seen in the past, it's pretty clear that when we are in this kind of change, you can't really predict what the end result is going to be. Nobody's that smart, or to put it more Candidly, there probably are people that smart, but they're off on their yacht because they have already made so much money. So for the rest of us mere mortals, 
I look at this and go, I'm not so sure about this. This was the work, whoops, sorry, this thing tends to go sometimes go one too many. This was the workshop on Monday. And I don't want to, I don't want to, to beat up on, on Brian, who did this workshop. Some of you went to it. I'm sure it was a perfectly fine workshop. But look at the title. Data-centric single-page applications with knockout jQuery, Breeze, and Web API. And they didn't even get Angular in there. And I'm told by the, the cool kids in HTML5 that I'm supposed to learn Angular right away. That it's the, because I like data binding, and apparently that's what Angular does. Well, I don't know about this. I mean, this is kind of the way I look at this situation. I first drew this diagram for an executive in 2008 who was saying to me, why does it take so long to get this stuff done? I go to the Microsoft events, and they just kind of go up there, blah, 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 15 minutes, complete application, runs all over the world, and scalable, and they've been doing that stuff as long as I can remember. The demos don't look any harder today than they did in the late 90s, but we know that in fact, it gets harder to do every year. I personally do not believe this trend of layering on JavaScript libraries as a solution is sustainable. I think we've already reached a threshold of complexity that's pushing people out of the industry or sending others into quiescence because they just, look, how many of you work for companies where there's only two or three developers? That's, that's about half the crowd. Do you feel like you can assimilate everything you're supposed to to make all of this work? Not to mention the fact that, let's suppose you do. Let's suppose you take, oh, three months or whatever it takes and learn all the new JavaScript libraries you're supposed to do and produce this software, this business software that uses all that stuff. Let's suppose that you do that and you, you really, you're really careful and you do it well. And now, how long do you expect that software, how long is it supposed to work in the business? How long does a typical medium-sized business or small business expect the software you created to be working for them? Minimum five years, right? Eight or 10 is more common, is it not? Okay, so what's gonna happen though when you come back in four years and have to make changes to it? Well, first of all, it might not even be you, because we move around a lot in this industry, don't we? So some other poor schmuck comes in, and there's all this stuff, and, and he makes a minor change, and it just breaks the whole thing. Because who knows what kind of browser compatibilities we're going to have four years from now compared to what we have now with all the devices that are multiplying. So he can make something work, and he starts to try to do something, and he tries for, to go online for help. You, JavaScript guys familiar with this? You go online for help, and you go, well, I'm in version 1.0. 4.27 of this thing, and, I, and the first response you get back is, noob, nobody's using that version anymore. <laughs> you have to upgrade to 3.6.92, then somebody will answer your questions. Okay, have you had that experience, some of you? Uh, this stuff just, it changes so rapidly. That is not compatible with small business. Small business is not paying you to produce software for your personal growth and development and to do the stuff you like to do, they're doing it to make money. And this does not look like a path to me to make money because it gets worse every year. I think we're already past the complexity threshold for a lot of small companies. Now, so this trend line I don't think can go on forever. In fact, if I had to encapsulate the single most important sentence of the 21st century, it would be this. If something cannot go on forever, it will stop. That sounds obvious, doesn't it? But we have national debt, we have complexity and various, nothing goes on and increases exponentially forever. Eventually it stops. The question is, does it stop in a controlled fashion, where we can deal with it, or does it stop in a catastrophic condition? I don't want your businesses 
to reach that stress point, that stopping point, in a catastrophic way. I want you to understand this change well enough to adapt to it and, and be pragmatic about how you're going you're gonna to handle it. As I said, I think that this, this kind of trend is unsustainable and that the current trends, therefore, on HTML5 and JavaScript are unsustainable, but the industry is just covered up with people that don't just say that this is viable, but it's the only way you should do anything. I, I remember reading a, a blog post by some young snot from Microsoft about two years ago, about the time that Windows 8 had been rolled out at build, and he said, well, in 18 months, everybody will be writing all their front ends and, and HTML5 and JavaScript. He said that. My response on Twitter was, in other news, three-year-old thinks everyone should drink only milk. <laughs> Why do they say that? Because that's what they believe based on their very limited perspective. Do you realize that most of the people at Microsoft don't really write application software. Many of them have never written it in their lives. They do not understand the stresses you're under. And to the extent that they try to go out and listen, for the last 12 to 15 years, the people they've been paying attention to are enterprise, because they started the .NET era competing with Java. So to the extent that they understand the application development problem space, it's from an enterprise perspective. Now, we know there are differences between these small to medium companies and enterprise. In an enterprise, we might be able to be willing to pay the price for a lot of this complexity, because we might want to get all of this reach. There are, there are various parts of that kind of a solution, and we can afford it. We can have a 40-person team to keep all of this stuff working. And, uh, we, yeah, we lose people, but if we got a 40-person team and we lose one, well, we can adapt to that. We find somebody, we give them a chance to, 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 to come, come aboard and, and figure out what to do. But if we're a two-person team and you lose one, what does that do to you in today's environment? So I, I, the people who are saying a lot of this to me, I go, wait a minute. First of all, do you understand what's coming on the future? How about all those new ways of interaction? We don't even have decent support in HTML5 right now for touch. We've got some very, very simple generic su support. But we don't have the ability to go in there and, and work with various gestures in a way that we do on native platforms. And touch is one of the ways we get really innovative user interaction and user experience. And, and as I said, Who's going to maintain that snake pit of libraries when they, when they get obsolete? Is this really the right answer for not just business software, but as far as a lot of these people tell me, for all business software? I, I'm quite skeptical that we have, we have seen the future in a way that's, that's, uh, that's viable. So why do they say these things? Well, as I said, sometimes it's lack of perspective. Let's face it now. Sometimes it's self-interest. If you have immersed yourself in this technology, inside or outside Microsoft, if you're the thought leader, if you're the guru on this stuff, where does your self-interest lie in convincing everybody else to use it? Why? Well, that sure increases demand for your services, doesn't it? So don't overlook that factor of self-interest in the people that are promoting a lot of this stuff. And understand, they're not doing it consciously. Uh, there aren't people out there who are telling you these things that they know to be false in order to just lead to more income for them. I mean, there might be a few, but there aren't very many. Most of the time, they're completely sincere in what they're telling you. But we have an entire branch of economics called public choice economics that deals with the fact that individuals look after their own self-interest. Even when they're supposed to be or theoretically looking at the public interest. The other reason that they do it is because there's a demand for it. Let me explain what I mean by that. You guys have jobs to do. You have software to produce, you have businesses that, that depend on you. 
in periods of very rapid change. You just want to get your job done. I run into this a lot. People want answers. They, they absolutely hunger for answers. They don't have time to look at Objective-C and Cocoa and XAML and, and whatever the flavor of the month JavaScript library is. They don't have the time for that. They want to be told what to do. And I'm sure many of you are at this conference for that. And I, to an extent, I have a little bit of bad news for you because I run into this a lot in the client space, both on the design side and on the technology side. On the design side, I get, asks, I get asked all the time, I have this problem and I, what, what would be a design to fix this? And uh, my 98% answer is, it depends. It depends upon a lot of things about your circumstances and your users and your technology. There isn't any one size fits all design answer. And that's really not what they want to hear, but I don't have any better answer to give them than that. And in the technology side, what they ask basically, they ask the question in all kinds of ways, but what they're asking ultimately is, what's the safe choice? If I'm going to go out and create a new client tier for my company, what technology do I choose? I don't want to be in three years finding out that I've made the wrong choice and my boss fires me or, takes a, or doesn't give me a raise. What is the safe choice, Billy? And my unfortunate answer is, at this point in time, in an area of reptilian change, there isn't one. There is no safe choice you can make right now. There is no safe choice you can make right now because things are changing too fast. You can go native on various ways. We don't know what's going to happen to a lot of those technologies. Even iOS has started to see some decline in market share. You could go XAML. What's the future of XAML? I don't know, and Microsoft is pretty closed-mouthed about telling me. How about HTML5 JavaScript? We already explored that. I can get the best libraries available today, but what, what kind of condition will I be in in three years or five? What kind of browser and compatibilities will have come up by then? So you see, there is no safe choice. You have to choose one. The main thing that I tell people is, bring your time horizons in. Don't look to eight to 10 years. You just can't expect that. They tell you that HTML5 is, oh yes, well, it will always work. No, it won't. Eight years from now, do you think all the browsers will run everything that's being produced today? I guarantee that's not true because all the browsers don't run this stuff right now. <laughs> so there, because there is a demand for clear answers, for clarity, there are plenty of text experts and influencers journalists, they will provide those answers even if they don't exist. Now, let me stress again, I don't mean to imply that these people are trying to deceive you. They, they believe the things they say. They're convinced that what they're telling you, the processes they're teaching you are the right things to do. And they often are for some subset of the industry. Let me tell you something I'm, I'm going to put up, and I'm going to, I'm going to stress it here again in a minute. It is okay for any text expert or guru to say, look, I have this thing. It works for me, and I think it will work for you. It is not okay to say, it works for me, and it will definitely work for you, and there's something wrong with you if you don't use it. I'm going to be hitting this again in just a, just a couple of minutes. So when, when you get enough of these people putting these answers out there that, that they, they talk about it with confidence, even though I've been watching this business for my entire career, I do not feel the confidence that those answers are right. But nobody wants to go on stage and, and, and give a nuanced, that doesn't sell their courses and stuff. That doesn't sell their consulting hours. So they, they've learned not to do that. They talk themselves into believing that they know the answers even when maybe they don't. And as a result, certain answers tend to become trends. They get picked up and amplified by enough people. The current one is bring your own device. We must do HTML5 so that we can support all of these devices that everybody is bringing into the business. And you know what? 
why, why, who's driving that in the businesses? Executives. Because executives think nothing of going out and paying four or $500 for the latest device every six months. And when they get their new toy, they want to bring it into the business and run their whatever reporting stuff on it. So yes, our software must work on any device. Let me tell you, I've talked to the guys in the warehouse. When we looked at converting from a clipboard system to a mobile tablet system, if I had suggested to them, why don't you spend four or $500 on the device that we're gonna put in the warehouse? They would have looked at me like I was insane. That, and switch it out every six months? What for? You switch it out when it breaks, when you drop it one too many times. For most of what goes on in the business, they're not buying the device. The people who are, who are buying it determine what it is, and everybody pretty much gets the same thing. What's the value of reach in that situation? What's the value of working on every conceivable device? I don't see any, but what, what you hear from people is, well, we have, to, we have to have broad reach. I just don't get that. And from my perspective, as somebody who works on the design side and is trying to make these users as productive as I can, sacrificing productivity, usability, ease of training, et cetera, to get reach, looks like a really stupid business decision to me. Look, I finished some design on a, on a, with a client last year. I worked with them for several weeks. They have 9,000 users of their base system. We believe, based on some very conservative metrics, that we're probably getting 10% productivity increase. Let's say it's only 5%. Let's even cut that back. If it's 5%, you can do the math and discover that they are saving somewhere in the neighborhood of $50 million a year in labor costs. And you're going to throw that $50 million away to get reach? No. Those people are sitting at their desk. They're brokers. They're sitting there doing brokering transportation services all day long. Why in the world do I worry about making stuff work on a touch device? That would be a disaster for them. But they do need modern UI. They need to embrace some of these things that, that we're changing, some of the things that we've learned about how we make data more visual to them, interpret it better. I, those of you who came to my Modern Apps session yesterday saw some of that. They need that sort of thing, but we don't have to sacrifice their productivity to get reached to get that. We can do that on just standard desktop software. And then I want to talk about some of this. Well, gosh, we're going to customize what this big group of users needs. And maybe we do a completely separate system for the guys in the warehouse on tablets because their needs are different. I'm not going to do a one-size-fits-all that runs on every device in the company. That's, that's just nuts. Well, but look how much more money you're spending on development for the extra version. Doing one UI version saves money. That's an arithmetic challenge statement, really. Because users tend to outnumber developers about 50 to 1. Is that about right for most of you in your businesses? Sometimes a little less than that, sometimes more. So we can do the math then. Increasing user productivity by 2% will beat a 100% increase in developer productivity. The problem is that you are conditioned to think you can only affect developer productivity, therefore that's what you work on. No, if you want to be valuable to your businesses, you got a 50 to 1 leverage if you can make the rest of the business more productive and not just you. So let me, let me talk about some corollaries to this. Oops, sorry. This thing has developed a short, I think. This is, oh, I have, to, I have to make my disclaimers to start with. I'm going to talk about some things, and I'm going to talk about them being oversold and that they, they have some flaws. Every time I do this, Twitter lights up with <laughs> Hollis hates unit testing, Hollis hates agile, Hollis, no. If you put that on Twitter, you are telling an untruth. 
I believe that these things have value. I absolutely do. I do not believe, though, that they are as universal as their proponents tend to claim that they are. Unit testing and MVM, uh, MVVM are, are, are good ones to kind of pick on because the, the people who are devoted to them have certain absolutist dogmatic statements about them. The ones who go to the church of unit testing instead of just using it as a tool. Because, look, I saw unit testing, especially for stateless server code. I thought, oh, this is a good idea. I like this. This, and I'm going to explain a little bit why about, later about why I think it's good for certain circumstances. It does have value. But if you then t say, well, if unit testing in some places is good, unit testing everywhere must be great. So let's unit test every, every line of client code. Let's not put anything in the client that can't be unit tested. And that's where MVVM came from. Let me tell you what the problem with this is. Here's an example of some stuff that I fudged up for a, for a client. I did a variation on this yesterday. This is a, where you've got a transportation system, and you're, you've got some uh, symbols that represent certain things about stops in a shipment and such. That kind of thing, we have design principles and various other things that tell us that users learn, especially if they use the system a lot, that they learn to parse and interpret that information much, much faster because they're using the visual part of their, their mind instead of the conscious parse text parsing part of their mind. Your, your brain is amazingly fast at recognizing shapes and colors and such. So we do this. Now, the technology to produce it requires me to feed in some data and feed back out some visuals. Now, that code isn't very complicated. It's only about 30 or 40 lines. But it's really, really hard to unit test. It's hard to unit test anything that's returning visual objects. That's really messy. So if I'm going to be absolutist about it, I'm like, well, I, you shouldn't do that because we can't unit test it. We must impose an entire layer of new stuff on the client so we can unit test all the forms. Look, I was, when MVVM first came out as a big deal, I was talking to my, uh, to my partner about it because we didn't get very excited about it. And I really didn't understand what everybody else was so excited. So we were trying to figure out why. We came to the conclusion we just develop things differently. First of all, we have been accustomed for over 10 years now for developing systems that have multiple UI stacks attached to them for different classes of users which we think is an optimum way to get productivity for everybody. As a consequence, we shape our data models on the server quite extensively. We go through a translation process, get it out of the data, recast it, reshape it in a way that the user needs to see it. Well, that then works on all of our different UI platforms with that new user-friendly shape. So we don't have to put a view model to do that on the client system. And we already came up with a way so that most of our views have maybe eight, ten lines of code. And so the value of MVVM we saw as a lot less for us. And of course we do all that stuff with, with visual, uh, visual output that can't be tested very easily. But I don't see very many XAML de developers doing stuff like this to help the users. Why not? Well, they're kind of, they've got their blinders. They've got their MVVM blinders on. We do things this way. And I, if I can't unit test the code, I don't need to be writing it. No, you're not here to make the code organization simple. You're here to make the users' lives better. So it bothers me to see a lot of these things oversold. You don't want to put your, your preferences ahead of the needs of the user. And, and I also I do understand that, that one of the chief reasons why people tend to do this is that you, you got in this business to write code, many of you, maybe most of you. I've been told this before. I, I rail on people. And, you're writing too much code. You're, 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 you're putting code too important. And I've had people come up to me, Billy, I got in this business to write code. I don't think I can do anything else. Well, first of all, I think you're wrong about that. I think most of you have latent capabilities you can't even imagine. But you just don't even work that part of your brain out because you're sitting in an office or cubicle training the left side of your brain eight hours a day. 
So you're kind of on that path, and, you, and, and that's your comfort zone, and you don't want to get out of it. But for, for quite a few of you, it gets worse than that. I've joked about this for years, but it is a good way to explain what I think is one of the root problems when people, for example, want to talk about MVVM in XAML instead of talking about how you make things better for users. See, the first time I looked at XAML, I went, wow, there's a great technology to give a better user experience. Therefore, the first things I need to use is learn are how can I make better user experiences? How can I learn the layout and all the good things that you can do with it? But at conferences, starting about 2009, 2010, every other session was, the first thing you must learn to do XAML is MVVM. Okay, if your team is big enough, it's probably worth it. But the first thing you need to learn? No, the first thing you need to learn is to explore the potential of that technology to make your users a whole lot more productive. But, but people didn't want to do that. And I know one of the reasons. As I said, I've joked about it for years. I joke about the fact that, that over half of people in our industry, including half the people in this room, have a serious substance abuse problem. The substance they abuse is code. <laughs> I mean, you think about it. Code heads, coke heads. Both, both types of addicts get their, get their fix by doing a few lines. <laughs> I've developed several diagnostic tests. I mentioned one yesterday. For the benefit of the whole crowd, I'll, I'll tell you again. Um, have you ever been in that meeting where you were going to do a new module or a new function or something for the system? And the meeting is supposed to last an hour or 90 minutes. And the sponsor is going to tell you how it's supposed to work. So they've got you there, you're at the conference table, and they start to go through it. Five minutes into it, you're no longer listening to what they're saying because you are coding the solution in your head. <laughs> All right. I see some nervous nods. You realize that's a sign of an addiction, don't you? <laughs> you can't put code aside for 90 minutes to listen to somebody. No wonder you want to learn MVVM first. Learning how to make users more productive might make you go out there and talk to some of them. <laughs> See, people talk so much about efficiency and from my perspective, doing the wrong thing more efficiently just isn't much of a win. Now, let me make a disclaimer again. I, I don't hate any of this stuff. I think all of it has solid places where, it, where, where it's valuable. And it's okay to say that it works for you. It's okay for people to stand on stage and say you should try it. It's not okay to say, you must use X because nothing else works. Is that a self-evidently stupid statement to you? Is there anybody who thinks that statement there has any significant validity in most of our processes? Because I'd like to talk to you after the session if you do. Okay, so most of you are in agreement with me. You think we don't see this? Let me read this sentence to you. Industrial process control theory is a proven body of knowledge that describes why Scrum works and other approaches are difficult and finally untenable. Do you understand how to translate that nonsense? He is saying Scrum works and nothing else does. D do you see any other potential meaning for this sentence? Now this is one of the founding fathers of this discipline. And he has the nerve to tell me if I, in all of the successes I've had over 20 years, that I was doing it all wrong. When I took a company and added $2 billion to their stock value and let them increase in size by a factor of 10 in five years, I was doing it wrong because I didn't use Scrum. When me and my team put together a healthcare application that caused a company to be bought by Xerox Corporation, making the founders rich, we were doing it wrong. Don't let these people tell you this stuff. 
And don't let your executives tell it to you either because executives don't really understand what you do. You might as well be in the back boiling a cauldron and saying magic spells. <laughs> they don't know. So they're easy prey for the folks like this who will get that. They have that same hunger for clarity and obvious answers that you do. Maybe even worse. They have more riding on the line in many cases for success or failure than you do. So they want clear answers too. And in many cases, they'll latch on to guys like this. Other issues I see, I think many of our thought leaders are just out of touch because I think they don't do as much development as they should. Um, I see that they don't focus on users and businesses as much as they do technology. They worry more about code and process. There's also contempt for a certain type of developer. The GRD stands for get her done. <laughs> people that just want to get the software out there. There's contempt for those people. Uh, and then there's also, I see some false, let's go through some of these. Thought leaders out of touch. Now, my own general principle here is, and I would advise you to, to follow this. I do not take advice on building software from people who don't build software. So if that guy's been teaching his class for five years and he hasn't developed any software in five years, his advice is useless to me now. I don't care. Things change too much in five years for me to uncritically accept his advice. That doesn't mean that I won't listen to people like that for ideas. I will. But I will test those ideas against my circumstances, against the problems my businesses and my teams face. I won't accept them uncritically, no matter how big a name they are. Let me tell you about a, a real situation to kind of understand some of this out of touch. This is a true story. You may have heard me tell it on .NET Rocks a few years back because it happened at a conference. It was at the Patterns and Practices Architects Summit in, uh, in Redmond, the Microsoft Conference Center. Uh, this was been circa 2009. And there were a couple of guys from Patterns and Practices there. And one of them was there with his pair programmer. They liked pair programming, and they did a session on it. Now, like all the other stuff, I think pair programming is interesting. I think there are some situations in which it might be a good idea. If you're learning new technology, two people there at the same time might very well speed things up to the point where you're doing better than either one of you alone. Um, but he had advocated pair programming for everybody all the time. Okay, then in his next session, he, he was a big unit testing fanatic. And he said, I write about four lines of unit testing code for every line of production code. <coughs> Four lines of testing code for every, man, that's a lot of code. I'm, I'm thinking code addict there, right? And I'm actually, I'm muttering code addict under my breath. And the conference organizer is sitting next to me and, and hands me a mic and says, you have to tell the people on stage that right now. So I did, I said, you, you guys sound like code addicts to me. And they've never forgiven me for that. <laughs> <coughs> So he's talking about doing all this testing code. That's a lot of extra code, man. And then he says, uh, and then when it comes to human testing, he says, my preferred ratio of testers to developers is two testers to one developer. How many of you have that ratio in your company? <laughs> How many of you have one tester per developer? One, one person. How many of you is it more, uh, okay, a, a smattering. How many of you is it more like one tester for two or three developers? Is that more typical? And then so how many of you is it worse than that? <laughs> okay, that's the real world. So he says, I prefer to have two testers for every developer. And my response to that was, I prefer to have two blonde supermodels in my bed every night. <laughs> But the world isn't constructed. The real world doesn't allow for that possibility. Therefore, there's no point in preferring that. And I thought about this from a business manager's perspective. Because as I said, they don't really know what we do. And they don't really get the unit of work, how productive this stuff is. So I'm thinking, well, if I'm a business manager, suppose I've got two developers and one tester right now. An optimistic scenario, according to most of you. Uh, and then, okay, I want a pair program. Well, that, whoops, sorry. If I go to pair programming, that means I'm going to increase to four. Am I going to get any more work? He probably doesn't think I'm going to get any more work. I'm just, I've just turned programming into a social activity, as far as he's concerned. 
And then I'm writing three, four times as much code. So, whoops, this thing just wants to do two at once. Um, so now I've ended up with 12, maybe, instead of the two. But I want two testers per developer, which means, so, whoops, it's a total of 36 compared to three before. No business guy's ever going to go for that. And to seriously stand on stage and propose it meant that man was out of touch with reality. So remember that when you see people up here on stage. Okay? Some of them are going to give you great information. That's why you're here. You're going to learn things. You're going to go back and, 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 and have ideas and ways of, of accomplishing things that you would not have if you didn't come. So I believe these conferences in, in an era of very rapid change, you have to have a way to keep up. And this is one of the best ways to do it. But that doesn't mean you uncritically accept anything somebody says to you from the stage. Not even what I say. So remember that as you're watching sessions. I, the out of touch thing. I saw this blog post after I had done, I don't remember exactly what prompted this, but it was when I, again, said I didn't think unit testing was perfect. And the original post, the title of this was, Why Billy Hollis is Out of Touch. And he changed the title later to How Test First Development Changed My Life, which... I'm sorry, if test first development changes your life, I don't know what kind of a life you had before that. <laughs> but it must have sucked. <laughs> I, I, look, speaking of sucking, when I saw this, I, look, I'm not looking at it from the business guy's perspective. But from my perspective, if you need somebody looking over your shoulder for everything you do, and you've got to write four lines of testing code for every line of production code. And then you've got to have four testers, because it's your pair, right? Your, your ratio. Four testers testing everything you do. You must suck as a coder. <laughs> and I don't, I don't get this either. I don't, I don't understand people who immerse themselves in something in, in a way that they develop some kind of spiritual attachment to it. I was... Uh, we're interviewing a guy. I often interview for clients. I was interviewing a guy at a coffee shop who uh, was, was interviewing for a position on a team at my client's site. And I'm asking him the stuff I'm interested in. And it became clear about halfway through, he wants to talk about test-driven development. And I'm not asking about it. So we're probably two-thirds of the way through, and, and he leans over the table and says, I think you should know. I'm passionate about test-driven development. See, I can't help it. The thoughts just come in my head. <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, man, you should be passionate about your wife or your girlfriend. Because <laughs> that's kind of the way the world is supposed to work. So when people start to talk about things in those terms, to me, that means they're kind of out of touch. Now, one of the last things I want to talk about is this false dichotomy I hear from a lot of these folks. They, the false dichotomy comes up in a lot, a lot of ways. The, if you don't use this, you're doing it wrong, is one of them, is an example of a false dichotomy. And another one is to claim that there's no processes out there but Agile or Waterfall. I've run into this many times. We have our own process. We've developed it over the years starting in the mid-90s. We have an unbroken record of success with it. I'm not really interested in changing it. But I wouldn't recommend it to you because my team is different. It's really different from what most people do. But uh, when I tell people in the Agile community, you know, we don't really use an Agile process. Oh, you must do waterfall then. No. It's not that there's just, and, and there's contempt, of course, for people who do waterfall. Now, understand that I find that to be short-sighted and a lack of perspective. Because there seems to be, among agile proponents, this feeling that the waterfall guys were just idiots. Forever doing this. That was never a good way to develop software. Men, you never walked in their shoes. They built the international banking system on machines with less power than this watch. 
your financial transactions are still going through their code today. They were in a world where CPU power, memory, and disk space were all less than one ten thousandth of what's sitting right there, right now. In that world, it was necessary to specify everything to the nth degree. Because the consequences of something not working and sucking up resources were that you brought hundreds of people to a grinding halt. It worked for them. The problem with it was they held on to it out of short-sightedness long after it was no longer an optimal methodology. Well, remember our increasing complexity. Agile was developed to treat this problem. Agile, if I had to, to name the, th the reason it became popular and the reason people thought about ways to do it, it's to manage the complexity of development because it's just so hard to do. Well, that's fine, but if what goes on forever must stop, what are the implications there? Look, this is the world, of, this is the world that Agile was made to, to deal with. We got, a, we got a user at one end, a database at the other, and five layers of plumbing in between. We got business logic, oh, who knows where it is, and typically in these layers somewhere. Of course you need something to manage this kind of complexity. You have tons of plumbing. Of course you need unit testing. You need something to find out if the plumbing leaks before it causes bigger problems. Yes. Those methodologies had a purpose in this world. But how will the, the optimal methodology change when we move into this world? Because right now we've got the, we, we, we're, we get back down to two layers of plumbing probably. That is the cloud standardizes everything. So now we don't have as much plumbing to test. And the plumbing that's there, a lot of it's being tested by the people who created the cloud. So do we really need all this stuff to test that was optimized for testing plumbing in this world? I'm not sure we do. And I'm wondering maybe if we're going to move to a world where we do separate that business logic out and have it executed by some kind of an engine. Because what we've got today is just, you know, it's all mixed up. But what if we had all of the actual application in some kind of metadata repository with data in the cloud, an execution engine with all the plumbing that put all that together and was able to channel out to different kinds of devices an optimized user experience for each device. Would that be a nicer world to live in than the one we have today? I think it would. And I think that we will probably get to some version of this eventually. Especially because those small to medium sized guys I talked about need it so bad. They're the ones who have the most trouble with complexity today. Unfortunately, that means a lot of changes. Maybe more than moving from water, waterfall to agile. So I think agile advocates, just like the waterfall guys, will insist on using it because they're comfortable with it long past the time that it's the optimal ideology, uh, uh, process for our times. And I believe that because I see contempt for other ways of doing things. I was in Redmond when Visual Studio Light Switch was rolled out. Now, this is kind of a very proto version of this world of metadata, et cetera, but it is an honest attempt at moving in that direction. After a 15 minute demo, here were some of the things we saw on Twitter. I don't expect a carpenter to build a house without knowing how to swing a hammer. Please stop insulting my career, Microsoft. Will, my, will Microsoft stop fantasizing that decent usable software can be built without writing any code? Just when we thought fixing biz built MS Access apps was sh slowing down, Microsoft kicks us in the blank with Light Switch. Can we call it like it is? Light Switch is Visual Studio for dummies. That's the kind of attitude I see among our professional software craftsman class. And I consider that to be unacceptable. So some recommendations to finish out. Be skeptical of the gurus that, that, have the, that think they have the, the one size fits all answers because as I said, they believe it, but that doesn't mean you have to. Decide if things work for your circumstances and your users. 
and get ready because the cloud, the cloud's gonna change things more, I think, than most people realize. I remember when the IBM guys made this mistake. When the PCs came in, to a mainframe guy, a PC was nothing more than a 3270 terminal that also ran a word processor and a spreadsheet. That's really the way they looked at it. For a lot of you, you're thinking of the cloud as just a big database out there in the sky. Don't think of it that way. It's gonna change your world much, much more than that, just as it changed those mainframe guys' world. Kick your code addiction and embrace diversity. Um, any evolutionary biologist will tell you that in rapid, times of rapid change, the key to adapting and succeeding is diversity. I see too many teams that will only hire people who think exactly the same way as everybody else on the team. I don't think that's healthy. I think you need to be exposed to more diverse technologies and don't try for that. Let's just stay in this channel and, and, and put blinders on and not look at anything else. In the world of working with your users, as most people know from my courses on design, I embrace experimental design. The idea that we're gonna try a lot of different things to see what works. Those are all aspects of diversity. In a period of rapid change, diversity is your friend. So I hope basically that this, this gives you a pretty good idea of some ways to handle this. Shorten down your time frames. Don't take these grand pronouncements at face value. And you know, this job is supposed to be fun. When you find yourself grinding away at some of the stuff that they want you to do, that ought to be a sense to you that maybe this is, a, this is not the path you want to be on.